Good morning, Rob. Good morning, Jonathan and John Gilstrap. Morning. Good morning. You're at the Greenbrier this week for a couple of days to the Southern Legislative well, we're Conference. Staying at a Airbnb outside the Greenbrier. Mike Height and I couldn't afford to stay in that <laughs> actual Greenbrier. <laughs> you're just good old boy legislators from West yeah, Virginia. That's right. <laughs> what is the Southern Legislative Conference, Michael? So it, it's basically a policy conference and staff conference uh, for the southern states. You think of Texas up to Missouri and across to West Virginia. We're probably the most northern state. Um, it, it, it's a it's a, a conference where we get together. We talk about policies that are working in our states. We we do a lot of roundtables. There's a lot of breakout sessions. We sit with other uh, legislators, senators, and, and congressmen, and discuss what's working in their states. And uh, you know, decide to move forward. And then there's training sessions for um, for staff members too. I know you haven't been in the legislature for 20 years, uh, but uh, still. Uh, has any, yeah. anything come of this in the past that you've worked on legislatively in West Virginia? Well, I think uh, last year I went down to uh, Charleston. I definitely had two bills that I introduced that came out of this. I think there are major um, policies that come out of these kind of things because you get ideas of what's working. I know for me in the education um, um, committee, I, I really lean on the South Carolina folks. They've got really good results down there. So I try to get with as many of the South Carolina folks and, and find out what's working for them. When you say Charleston, you meant South Carolina, right? Yes, yes. That's where you were last year. Are there many folks from the West Virginia delegation who are attending this? We've got about a third of our um, House members here. I think there's about 30. Um, it is voluntary. So, um, and it is, uh, I mean, it's, it's, You've got to pay for yourself to, to come down here. So um, it's one of those things where you, if you choose to do it and you feel like you can get something out of it um, and it suits your schedule, then uh, then you're allowed to come. Is leadership there? Oh, absolutely, yes. Craig and Roger are both here. Mr. Gilstrap. What are people coming to – are people approaching you uh, from other states wondering what good things we're doing or are we – is, is the flow of information pretty much the other way? Well, John, they're not you know, seeking me out, as you know. I'm not, I'm not in leadership. But, yes, I mean, we are in roundtable discussions at, at the certain breakout meetings asking what we're doing that works well because there are, there are a number of things that West Virginia is leading on um, that a lot of people are interested in um, in, in the different – and there's, there's a myriad of, of options that you can choose – uh, to attend during the day. So uh, our delegation kind of splits up and, and, you know, four here, five there, and, and represents the state and listens and, and, you know, finds good ideas. So what's the big nugget for fixing the education system? <laughs> we're, we're getting there. I, I, you know, I don't think there's a uh, one bill uh, fits all. I think our, our, our school aid formula needs uh, fixing, and that's going to take us uh, a good part of the next year to, to fix that. Who else from the Eastern Panhandle delegation is down there, Mike? Um, yeah, obviously, uh, Delegate Height is here. Uh, I saw Delegate Espinosa uh, yesterday. We haven't done a lot of sessions together, um, but Paul is here. Um, obviously, Craig Blair is here. Um, and that's pretty much it from the EPO. Oh, and Wayne Clark, too, from Jefferson County. Wayne Clark. Very good. Mr. Bodwell. Mike, what um, what do you think is the the most important thing that you want to get ideas about besides education that you want to get ideas about from this conference that you think may help West Virginia? You know, one of the, the best breakout or best uh, speakers yesterday, Roger was part of a – Roger Henshaw was part of a uh, – um, uh, a roundtable with the speaker from Tennessee, a senator from Virginia – um, and, and it was basically talking about how the federal government, you know, they've only passed 27 laws, I believe, in the last year, um, how we get policies moving forward despite the federal, the feds, you know, and their, their, their blockages of things. And I thought that was one of the most interesting things is how the states are leading, uh, especially the southern states, are leading in policy 
despite the, the regulations from the, the, the Fed. So I thought that was a really good breakout session. I took a lot from it. Um, you know, our third third grade success act was uh, was touted in that, and I think uh, mm-hmm. it, it was it was really interesting. It, it's really about listening um, and learning, and then moving forward from there. So, how big a ripple? I'm going to guess there's more Republicans there than Democrats. So, how big a ripple did the uh, Kamala bomb uh, make? Actually, you know, in our delegation, all of most of the Democrats are here. Um, it's it's totally bipartisan. So there are a lot of uh, Democrats here. They were giddy um, on Sunday evening. Um, I know, uh, you know, I saw Mike Pushkin was on the phone a lot. But you know, when I talked to uh, Sean Fluharty and Kayla Young, um, they were really excited about their party's uh, prospects moving forward. They, you know, they seem extremely happy and not as depressed as they usually are. <laughs> <laughs> we had Pushkin on yesterday and he was uh, I heard. he was in a pretty good mood. Yeah. I, I saw your yeah. comment during the course of the uh, thing. What sessions are you attending today, Mike? Anything specific on the breakouts? Uh, I'm really looking forward to tomorrow. Actually, it's the uh, uh, Homer Hickam is the, the, oh, yeah. the keynote, um, which I think uh, that's really exciting for me. Uh, I'm attending a agriculture uh, session today, an education session, uh, and an economic development. We, I got a pretty busy day. Uh, we got options, so if you don't like something, you just bail on it and move into the next uh, room, which is kind of nice. It's all at the green bar, um, so the you know, little rooms are next to each other. So if there's something that doesn't interest you or that they're going in the wrong direction, you can kind of bail on them and move into the next room, which is kind of fun. Is there legislation, Mike, coming up this this coming year that you are looking to propose that you're looking to get some guidance on and maybe some help on on ways to tweak it from other legislators at the conference? I, I think the biggest thing I personally am working on, and I'm, and, and again, it's, it's working with our West Virginia legislators too, I think the school aid formula is the biggest piece of uh, legislation that – I am looking to introduce it might not be this year because it, it is a major um, piece of legislation. But I, uh, that's the biggest thing that I think I could do. There are tons of other minor things I'm interested in, but it's kind of like uh, last year the raw milk was a minor thing that just happened to you know, fly through. Um, but the major legislation, you know, you got to work with staff, you got to work with tons of committees, you got to get input from everybody before you can uh, propose it and put it past the finish line. So, But the, the one I truly want to get past before I get done in the next two years is that school aid formula. So you got raw milk through. So when we had Roy Ramey on, I think it was Roy, and when he was a candidate for the Ag Commissioner, he was ex- explaining to us uh, how you, now that you can do raw milk, but you still, as a, say you're a, a, a cattle uh, rancher here and you can't do farm to table meat at these farmers markets in West Virginia? No, and that that's a federal uh, law. I, I tried to do something to, to get that through last year, but um, when you're battling the feds on certain regulations, um, you know, the lawyers just come to you and say, you guys can pass whatever you want, but this is not, you know, it's not going to go anywhere. Uh, is there, I up at Deep Creek, a couple of years ago, they had a big farmer's market up there I went to, and we bought some steaks from a guy right out of the back of his truck that were frozen, and he, he was some, you know, grain-fed beef guy, you know, had cattle on the on the property and whatever. Just, right. just don't mention his name I or his license his plate number, you know? <laughs> but it, it, so, he found a way so to do techni- it. Technically, you can. If you can get a uh, slaughtering slot at a USDA approved slaughterhouse, okay, you could do that. Uh, the problem is most of the uh, larger farms and larger businesses have all those slots. But if you could get a slot, and you usually have to book a year, year and a half in advance, you could get a USDA uh, slot for butchering, and then you could sell whatever you want out of the back of your car. I see. All right, but well. there's just not enough slots for a regular, you know, Joe Farmer to to do that on a regular basis, and that's the that's the issue we're finding. And I'm working with the agriculture department to try and get a West Virginia approved um, 
thing. So you can't sell out of state, but you can sell within the state. And, and those are the processes we're working on. So all these farms I see around here that have like 10, 12 head of cattle, what are they doing with those with that cattle most of the time they'll sell it to market and they're not actually processing it they'll just sell the sell it on the hoof and it sell it to a bigger uh slaughterhouse or a bigger uh processor um but the the, the bigger farms you know 100 plus thousand plus cattle they they generally have uh slots that they can do it um we do have a number of local in the eastern panhandle uh farms that do sell farm to table Damon Wright says, I bought meat from a local farm not too long ago. Maybe they're one of those folks with one of those slots, I guess. I don't know. And, and right now you can buy a half a cattle or a quarter uh, cow, um, and you go in with a couple of friends. You Before you go in, and you can do it at a local slaughterhouse, and yeah. that's how you do it. Because you've done that's that. That's the way around. Yeah, okay. But you can't buy one steak. You can buy a quarter cow. So uh, did, did you go – is August still the – the, the interim session, Mike, where you folks are expected to make some meaningful decisions on some money with the budget uh, and yes. such? Late, it's the last week in August. Um, that's been a lot of the discussion down here but between the uh, West Virginia delegates is what um, I haven't talked to. I've talked to Craig, obviously. I have a good relationship with him. Uh, but I've had a lot of conversations with uh, House members on what that's going to look like. And – do we find out what the tax cut's going to be at that time? Yes. You know, I think the proposal will be a 4% because of the automatic tax cut. And then the governor's asking for an additional 5 to 6 to, to make it even 30% is what the governor's asking. Um, the House seems to be, in my opinion, uh, from uh, the conversations I had, as long as we we do the right thing, I think we're we're – we're on board. I think leadership is, uh, I, I don't speak for them, but I think they are behind that proposal. Um, as long as there's some guardrails and we can put some reserve money away, um, I, I think the House will, will go along with that. And until we hear what the Senate is proposing or you know what we actually see, because we haven't seen it, um, we can't really make any decisions. But, but I think positive is uh, what I'm, I'm hearing. From what we've heard in the studio, it sounds like it's going to die an ugly death in the Senate. No, I don't think so. I, I, I truly believe there there will be something coming out, whether it, it's got strings attached or if it's. Uh, but I do think this uh, this will happen. Um, you know, I, I know we were we had uh, Craig and and John and everybody talking, and, and there's still lots of conversation to happen. But I still do think it's it's a very positive piece of legislation that will come through. So the the trigger would be four. Uh, I think four percent is where the trigger tops. Yes. Right. The range was three to four percent. So from that's going to happen whether, whether we go into session or not. Yeah. So so one way or the other, because the triggering mechanisms have been met, the math equals tax cut. That's yes. it, that's the minimum of what's going to happen. That is the the minimum. You're, we're definitely getting a four percent tax cut. All right. Does that then kick in with the very next paycheck people get, or do you have to wait till uh, January? I think 1? it's Jan one, is from my understanding. All right. And then when so do you, it's based on the year? I know you're not on the finance committee, but when do the financial calculations of the impacts of that then start to get factored into the revenue projections? So I think every uh, the, I think. Based, based on it now was in August, and I did sit in on a lot of the finance uh, committee last year. Um, so every August we'll find out. I do believe we passed a, a small piece of legislation that will move that up so we know sooner mm -hmm. so that we can pass a budget um, before the end of session. So I think that piece of legislation passed so that we will know what the trigger is much sooner than we did this year. Is that the reason why you have to wait until the August – interim session to figure out what the numbers should be? I think that was the reason this year we had to pass the skinny. I know there was the clawback the talk, but I think the main reason that we passed the skinny budget was the fact that we didn't know what the actual um, tax cut would be or if that trigger would, 
be enacted. But I think we passed or, or we we addressed that last session and we, we made it so we would know when we passed the budget what what those uh, figures would look like. You mentioned the Third Grade Success Act earlier in this conversation. Yeah. And that was to add an aid to classrooms K through 3. Was yes. was last year the first year of that, and this year will be the, the second year, and you add an additional aid? So this is the second year right now. I think it's the probably the greatest piece of legislation that I have voted on or co-sponsored. Uh, it, it, you know, it, the fact is, if a child can read and write at levels by third grade, their chance of succeeding through the rest of their school life and succeeding in life is, is almost doubled. Um, I think um, next year will be the, the, the third grade will be getting it. Um, I, I know, you know we're having trouble hiring aides, but once we get this piece in place, I think five years down the road, we're going to see amazing results from that, uh, that, that piece of legislation. How, um, and you said, talked about how um, you're having difficulty hiring aides as we're having in, in all of education, getting people to work. Yeah. What, uh, what, I mean, is there a percentage? I mean, roughly how many of the slots in the state were filled? Well, I think most of them were filled. The, the, the issue, uh, I know locally and I know uh, from other legislation, the issue was a lot of those aides kind of skipped from special education and went to the, the, the first, second, third grade um, piece because there was uh, obviously a, a pay increase and they didn't have to, um, you know, deal with special education. Uh, but I think we're, we're addressing that. We're moving in the right direction. Um you know, it's one of those pieces of legislation that it's a long-term piece that I think is going to pay dividends for years and years to come. And I know there's some bumps in the road, but we'll get through that um, and, and we'll move forward. Well, and it's I mean, it's it's so important what you said about, you know, if people are at grade level by third grade. Their chances go way up. I think that's phenomenal. What a what a great bill that you co-sponsored. Yeah, and I, I, it was probably the best piece of legislation I've co-sponsored since they've done it. Are there qualifications that aides have to meet? Um, yeah, they, they, um, I, I, I can't go into specifics, John, but yes, it, 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 you have to be, um, you know, to a certain level. Uh, it, it's a basic an assistant teacher. Um, I don't think they have to have a full teaching degree, um, but there are, we also have great legislation that we passed that helps those aides get to the full teaching level um, and helping them with the, the cost of their uh, tuition to get there, too. Because I know we have a lot of uncertified teachers that are in, in the classrooms. Are they, what's, what, what separates, I wonder, a, an uncertified teacher from a teacher's aide? Um, I, don't, I don't think there's a lot that separates those two positions. Um, I know an uncertified teacher, somebody that's, that's qualified a little bit or is trying to get to the certified level or maybe hasn't done that. Uh, I forget the name of the test, but... The uh, um, praxis. I, I yeah, think, I think an go. uncertified teacher has a degree and yeah. I think an aide does not. Okay. Would, yeah. I mean, I mean, an aide can. I'm not saying all aides don't, and but I don't, might, you don't have to have a degree. The process. Yeah, you don't you don't have to have a degree to be an aide. You have yeah. to be an uncertified teacher. You have to have a, a bachelor's, I believe. Yeah. Mike, how much of what you're doing down there is economic, and how much of it is education? Um, it, it, you know, there's a every committee that we have within the house has somewhere to go down here. There are, are many breakout sessions. I mean, from agriculture to economic development. Um, there's all kind of you know, tax credits, tax. Uh, tax increases, tax decreases, sales tax. It, there's something for everybody here. I mean, you, you can't attend all the sessions, but you can pick and choose which ones you want. And I think our delegation does well in splitting up and attending all of them. Why don't more people go? I mean, it, it sounds like uh, there's, well, I think, four or five I mean, Eastern there's a panel. monetary thing up to it, too. And, you know, look, we're a part-time legislature that, most of us have jobs, so you know you can't get away for three days or whatever it is. Um, it's not mandatory. I, I think 30 out of 100 is pretty darn good. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the guys that are live close 
are attending daily, and you know they don't have to spend the night, so it's a lot easier. Um, the Greenbrier is not exactly in the middle of the state; kind of out of the way for everybody. Um, it's closer to me for than Charleston, though. So, um, you know, for, for for us, it was, you know, Mike and I are, are really trying to build bridges, and, and we we thought it was important to um, come down here and and, and learn and and build relationships with our fellow delegates. Do any do any other states discuss locality pay at these things? Um, not so much because um, you know you got to realize a lot of these states. Like we talked to delegates from Florida, you know Florida's budget is just you know they spend more than our entire budget just on education. So a lot of these states are a lot bigger than us and. and um, it, it's hard to compare um, locality pay. I, I know Kentucky, you know, they, they do have uh, some of that. But um, it, it's we're a very distinct state because of the differences between the south, the north, the south and the panhandles, if you will. Um, we're in a very unique situation um, in West Virginia. The disparity between our citizens is quite large, Um and, and the disparity between housing prices is quite large in our state. That's pretty unique. All right, final question for you, Mike. How did you like last week? You know, it was pretty easy. I was I was actually a technical genius, is what John Gilstrap said. Um, he, he he said he enjoyed my company for the week. Absolutely. Um, the, the audience was begging me to be back yes. more. Yes. But, you know, what I liked was all the different pitches of feedback that you could get going in <laughs> yeah. and out. You know, it's, it's not just one tone. You can get varying tones of feedback. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it humbles me every time. I do it for two weeks of the year, and I've never loved Rob so much as those two weeks. How about that, Rob? And Mike, while I my love for you each day can't be questioned, it grows exponentially in the weeks that you fill in for me, and I get to take some time off. See how that works. And, and it's your fault because you told me I was the only one who could fill in with you, and I actually believed you. And I think you were just punishing me to, to make sure I knew how how much I loved you. No, you you are the only because you have access to guests. <laughs> John, I think they need. Well, a I mean, alone. And, and here's yeah. the thing. <laughs> I mean, we we had those guests on. Because, you know, I, I'm trying to show the rest of our audience what these folks are thinking and wh where they're coming from because we are such a diverse state. Have yourself a great day there, sir. You too, buddy. Thank you, Michael. See you, Mike. Thanks, guys. Take care.